Okay guys, um, just going to record a short video for you here to talk you through uh, paper one of the IGCSE exam. I know we've been through it a thousand times before, but I thought I'd just do one last run through before your final exam. Okay, so we are going to talk about a number of things. We're going to talk about, firstly, making sure you answer the right blimmin' questions, mentioning no names, um, that you read the question carefully, again, mentioning no names, uh, that you're confident with the structure and timings for each question, uh, that you are aware that you must include detail. Okay, this is so important, so you definitely must include this. Uh, some example explaining phrases to make sure you're getting up to the higher level sort of responses, and then we go through a few examples, and then there's a few last minute tips for the day. Okay, so in terms of answering the right set of questions, just a reminder then, if we go here, we've got an example paper. Okay, this is similar to the one you're going to see. And you've got two hours to answer three questions. Now, don't be confused by that. A question actually consists of three questions. Okay, this is question number one. And it's got three parts, 1A, 1B, and 1C. And you must answer two questions from what's called the core content which is here, section A, core content, it says answer any two questions from this section. And you can go through and you can see that there are eight questions to choose from. However, only four of those questions we've actually studied. Okay, the first four, because we've been doing the, um, the second part of the course, you don't answer, okay? So you ignore those. You're not gonna be answering about Italian unification. You're not talking about, tensions in Europe in, before 1914. No, we didn't do that. We didn't spend two years studying those. So we're not going to answer those questions. Instead, you're going to focus on the ones we have studied for two years. Okay. Starting with the Versailles settlement, the Paris Peace Conference, you might look at uh, the breakdown of peace. Uh, you know, there will be four topics here. And all you have to do is choose two. Okay. So you might answer question number five, for example, in which case you'd answer question 5A, 5B, and 5C, and then you might think that you fancy your chances on question seven, and then you do 7A, 7B, and 7C. Okay, that's it, you do two. Then once you've done that, the third question comes from our depth study. Now, my class, what we did was China, so you are gonna scroll down or flick to the pages of your exam booklet until you find the questions on China. And then there, you've got two choices. You cannot mix and match, okay? You cannot answer 17A and then 18B. You have to do either all of 17 or all of 18. You've got no choice, okay? But you do have a choice over which question to answer. So you might look at those and think, hmm, Mao's changes to the economy and society, you know what, I'm not so confident on that one, but I am far more confident with China's relationships with other countries. So you might answer the three sets of questions in, or sorry, the, the, the one set of three questions under question 18. Okay, really, really crucial. You do not get that wrong, because if you do, we are in big trouble. Okay, let me go through that one more time, just because I make sure you get this right. You answer three questions. You answer two from the options that we've studied, okay? And then you answer one from the China questions, okay? Easy. Okay. Next, once you've actually picked which question you are going to answer, you need to read the question carefully, reading through some of your mock answers and practice answers. Not many of you, but occasionally, there will be the occasional hiccup where someone won't read the question properly. And so these three questions here are examples of where people went slightly wrong. I had one person who has written, or in answer to the first question, how far do you agree that Mao's attempts at social reform are a success, wrote two wonderful paragraphs, beautiful paragraphs, um, all about economic reforms. Mm, not so sure should really have been writing about things like health and education. Uh, instead, he went for five-year plans and great leap forward. Not the same thing. So ultimately, he actually scored zero, which was a great shame. Because what he'd written was brilliant, just about completely the wrong thing. 
uh, question uh, the second example and this is classic age old has this has been a problem with students since the beginning or since the end of the cold war uh, writing about the wrong berlin okay if we're talking about the berlin blockade and we'll, we'll come back to this later but berlin blockade it's 1948 949 okay berlin wall 1961 very very different things yes they happen in the same city yes the same countries are involved but no they are not the same and do not mix and match the facts and, and factors that go into them it's a very very easy way of losing marks and then lastly when it comes to uh, these 10 mark questions where it says something like how far do you agree that Clemenceau achieved his aims at Versailles don't just talk about the one thing they've told you. If it's a how far question, that immediately means that there's another side to the story. And so if we're not just talking, you know, don't just write a couple of paragraphs about what the French got at Versailles. Oh, they were happy because the German army was 100,000 men and they demilitarized the Rhineland and blah, blah, blah. And this made them happy. And, you know, they'd lost a lot in the war, which was, don't just, yes, say those sorts of things. But you also need to say that he was, competing against Britain and America for kind of control of the terms of the Treaty of Versailles. And so, you know, they had their own agendas. And so he had to kind of bang up against them and also think about it in a longer perspective as well. Okay, in this instance, uh, Clemenceau actually loses an election after the First World War because the French people are basically unhappy with the deal that he got from the Paris Peace Conference. Um, you know, they felt he should have gone further in punishing the Germans. So, you know, there's in these uh, Cambridge exam questions, they only ever the questions only ever give you part of the answer that they're looking for, right? If he says Clementel, or if the, if the question paper says Clementel, they are talking about, or well, they want you to talk about a much broader range of things than just that, in order to ascertain and make a good judgment over how far you agree. Okay, so read the question carefully. My recommendation, as always, is to underline keywords, key commands, to make sure you're talking about the right thing. Okay, timings. Right, it's a two-hour exam. It's 120 minutes, and there are 60 marks. So, some simple maths tells you that you've got two minutes per mark. Now, if you follow that rule to the letter, and precisely that means that for a four mark question you've got eight minutes for a six mark you've got 12 and for a 10 mark you've got 20. however obviously you're not going to be able to keep to that strictly under real world conditions because you know you're just going to take a bit of time to scroll through the thing select which question you want that's going to take a few minutes thinking time already so in reality you're going to have slightly less than that to answer each of those but it should balance out because you're not going to spend at least you probably won't spend eight minutes on every single four mark question that you do. Um, likewise, you might be able to get a six mark question in under 12 minutes. So it will kind of balance out, but it's just these are rough guidelines, something to take into consideration. Again, do not fall into the trap of spending forever answering a four mark question and then running out of time to answer a 10 mark question. And the only other thing I'd say about timings is that if and when you finish the exam, if you've answered all the questions and you've still got 10, 15 minutes left, even if you've got two or three minutes left, try to resist the temptation. And I know it's very tempting because I've been there too, to sort of let out a huge sigh of relief, put your pen on the floor and go, and then just kind of relax for a couple of minutes. You're only ever going to do a GCSE exam once in your life. Maximize every second of that time. So use that time to reread your work because you will have made mistakes you will be writing fast you will have missed out a few words and those missing words might completely change the meaning of what you're trying to say on the second reread of something you might think of another fact which is more than likely so do spend time rereading your work and try to sort of add extra elements into it do not sit there and do nothing in the exam hall okay this only ever happens once in your life you cannot afford to waste a second of it okay Structure then, we've got your four marks. We've been through these before, but to get four marks, you must have four distinct points. And the keyword there is distinct. They must be different to each other. You cannot say the same thing in four different ways. You'll only get one mark out of four. Or you can have two distinct points, 
with some developing detail for each. That gets you four marks. Six marks, you're looking for two paragraphs, point evidence explain. And a 10 mark, you're looking for now, so we've put here sort of five paragraphs. Introduction, you can get away with out having an introduction, but I find that it helps you plan what you're going to say. Because the 10 markers especially, you do need to sit and stop and think and plan them before you start. So just a two sentence introduction would be good to say, firstly, to answer the question directly, how far do you agree? And we'll come to that, I think, in the next or in the next couple of slides we'll look at. In fact, let me skip to that slide now. Uh, we're talking about how how far do you agree, right? Is it that you totally agree? Is it you partly agree? Is it you totally disagree? To what, you know, how far, to what extent do you agree with this statement? So you must say that right at the beginning, which means you need to know what you think and what your conclusion is going to be before you start writing, okay? Don't fall into the trap of just, yeah, you're an exam, you're panicked, you're writing, and you think I need to get ink on paper and you just start writing, you don't know where you're going with it. Stop, plan, think, what are my three paragraphs going to be for factors one, two, and three? And then that will tell you how far you agree. And use those phrases, say I partly agree or I completely agree uh, or completely disagree. Try and make sure you use those phrases right at the beginning of your answer. Okay, so one or two sentences at the start for a little introduction and then straight into your factor one, two, and three. Now what you'll do is you'll write one factor uh, against the statement if you think, if you are sort of gonna go full on, if your balance of your argument is gonna be in favor of the argument, in favor of the statement, then you'll make one against like your own argument and then you'll make two for your argument. Okay, so if you think that you completely agree with the statement, you'll give one paragraph to say why people might disagree with it, but then you'll give two paragraphs to say why people like yourself would agree with it, and then you'll do a conclusion. When it comes to the conclusion, do not write a lazy conclusion. Do not just say, well, as you can see, there was a little bit of this and a little bit of that, so bleh, it's in the middle, right? Use your conclusion to put things in context to explain how what you're looking at links to the bigger picture of what was going on at the time, and then link that to that statement again of how far do you agree? Is it that you partly agree? Is it that you mostly agree? Is it that you completely agree? What is it, right? Right, as you go through all of these questions, the most important thing, or one of the most important things is this, in detail, and I keep on hammering on about this. So many of you, are so good at history and you know exactly what the right answers are. But when you start writing things, you start to get a bit lazy. It's almost like you're writing what you might say in class rather than what is looking for in an exam answer. You must put in more detail than what you normally would say. So for example, if I'm just talking to another teacher or a student about this, I might say, well, of course, you know, Truman wanted to contain communism. And that's a true statement, but I'm not going to get many points for that in the exam. In the exam, I must flesh it out. I must add in the spice of detail, okay? Like I've said to you before, as an analogy, you're cooking a meal. That first sentence, Truman wanted to contain communism, that's boring. That's a boring, bland meal. What you want is something exotic, something spicy, something delicious, packed with ingredients, packed with flavor. And so look at the second sentence, okay? Truman, who announced a policy of containment in 1947, boom, there's a date for you. That was quickly called the Truman Doctrine, boom, there's a name for you. Wanted to spread, stop the spread of communism throughout the world, starting with supporting the Greek government in their civil war. Boom, 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 ha ha, look at that, great example. Uh, against the communists after the British withdrew in 1947. Boom, another example, boom, another date, all right? That is a delicious, juicy, succulent paragraph of the types that we want to see. The first one is lazy bone idle, and you're going to get very few marks from it. Okay, now I'm going to completely stereotype here. It is mostly boys that fall into that first category. Boys, they you, you know the answers. You know all that stuff in red, but you can't be bothered to write it, either because you're lazy or you think it's too obvious or you think you don't need to. You do need to, otherwise you won't get the exams, okay? Do not cook boring paragraphs. Make them packed with detail, please. 
Right, once you've got all that detail in there, you now need to explain why what you've said is of any importance whatsoever. Okay, you can think of history in multiple ways. One way of thinking about it is a set of dominoes. One thing happens that leads to another thing, you know, cause, consequence. Another way of looking at it is a drop of water in a pond, creating a ripple effect. Um, another way of looking at it is you know, the kind of butterfly effect. Whatever, however you want to view it, stuff matters, right? So you need to say why it matters. And so to do that, if you use these sorts of phrases, because, therefore, however, this meant that as a consequence, this was the result of um, those sorts of phrases, you are immediately going to force yourself to start explaining why things were important. And that's where you pick up the, the good marks, okay? So if you can combine delicious detailed, juicy paragraphs full of historical detail with well-explained paragraphs that show why this was important or why this happened or what effect it had on something else or how it changed somebody's thinking or why it led to a process, whatever it might be, then you're going to pick up the really, really good marks. So combine detail with explanations and you are on to a winner. Right. Like I said before, we've done this already, the 10 marker, how far do you agree? You need to talk about, is it, you need to, and use those phrases, yeah? Use, a, use those, don't, don't try and be clever and think, oh, I'm not gonna use those phrases, it's too obvious. No, 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 say, if you totally agree, if you partly agree, if you totally disagree, try and use those sorts of phrases in the 10 mark answers. Right, on to some examples, okay? Um, uh, this is actually a four mark question, not a six mark question, that's an error in the PowerPoint, I'll change that in a moment. Um, but so a four mark question, remember we said either four distinct points or two points with developing detail. Okay, and here's a really great example I've taken from one of the guys in the class. And it says Hitler wished to establish a German homeland. So the question is, what was the greater Germany that Hitler aimed to establish? And it's but the Hitler wished to establish a German homeland within Europe, which encompassed all areas containing ethnically German groups. Boom, one mark. Then it's going to support that with some additional detail including areas in Western Poland and the Sudetenland, and provide a Lebensraum or living space for the population of Germany, which entailed the invasion of large parts of Central or Eastern Europe. Boom, two out of four, going well. All right, next point. Beyond this, Hitler wished to cleanse Germany of large numbers of non-ethnically German groups. Right, that's a distinctly different point to the first one that was made. The first one is about wanting to unite all German speakers. The second point is about, and then kicking out all non-ethnic um, Germans from within that space. So it's, it's two distinct things. So that it's good. He's not saying the same thing again in a different way. It's different, including large numbers of Jews and Slavs and the latter living primarily in the land captured by Hitler during the war. Easy peasy, four out of four. Right, six markers. What were Hitler's foreign policy actions, or sorry, why were Hitler's foreign policy actions in 1935, 1936 successful? Okay, I'm not going to read through those. You've got eyes. You can pause the video. You can read through them yourselves. In red, I've tried to highlight facts, figures, um, you know, examples that she's used in answering this question. And then I've got the, in pink, the kind of phrases that are explaining phrases, phrases that if you write these sorts of things, you're going to be... Um, you know, automatically forcing yourself to explain and justify your points. So that's, that's really good. And then the same thing here with a 10 marker. Okay, this one here is about Mussolini and to what extent or to how far he was responsible for the destruction of the League of Nations Authority. And same thing again, okay, in red, examples, detail, and in purple or pink, it's the explaining phrases. And you can see the structure there is really good. Okay, once again, 10 marker, and you've got one argument for, two arguments against, and a conclusion. And she's also got a small little introduction at the beginning. Okay, so getting to the last few slides now. Right, just before you do go into an exam, please make sure you revise this bit and don't get it wrong. It's the most one of the most common ways of losing uh, marks. Yes. Berlin blockade, yes, I know it says Berlin, but they are two very different things, okay, we've been through them, Berlin blockade, the Allies, they turn eastern, that's right, they turn western Germany into one united block called Trizonia, they create a new currency, it receives martial aid, all these things annoy Stalin, he then decides to try and prove that, um, you know, in his view, if the West are going to 
basically break the terms of the deal that was signed at Potsdam, then he is going to take over Berlin. And so to do that, rather than directly confront them militarily, he puts this blockade in place and the Allies respond with the airlift. Stalin looks cruel, Allies winning his propaganda victory when he has to end it in 1949. And then fast forward to 1961, okay, 11, 12 years later, we've got the refugee crisis. There was no refugee crisis when the Berlin blockade began, okay? Not to this extent and not, not that was of any real note. It all began in the 1950s and comes to a height in 1961. 2.6 million Germans have left, mostly young and educated. This is a brain drain on the USSR. It makes them not look very good. Um, and so they build the wall, pops up one night, starts off with a barbed wire fence. Later, they build the wall, two sets of walls with, you know, as you know, guard dogs, minefields, you name it, you know, patrols, towers, all sorts of things. Um, um, consequence makes the USSR look bad. It stops the brain drain and it removes a flashpoint in the Cold War. You know, previously you had German, uh, sorry, previously you had American and Russian tanks literally meters away from each other, pointing their guns at each other. And all it would have taken is one misunderstanding for essentially World War Three to have potentially started. Um, the wall kind of made the Cold War colder. You know, it froze things in place, but it did make Berlin itself slightly safer in that you were far less likely to have any misunderstanding that would lead to the two armies shooting at each other mainly because they were now separated by a giant wall and couldn't see each other. So it makes things safer in that sense. But of course, building walls is never a way to move things forward. Right, some simple tips. I'm sure you've been told these by other teachers, but um, things I would recommend, okay? Uh, a couple of days before the exam, use the same revision techniques that you've, you've tried and tested, and we'll use the ones that you're most familiar with and the ones you find most effective. Um, personally for me that was flashcards and recording things via audio, um, but obviously yours might differ. Uh, remind yourself of the exam structure, so get back up in this PowerPoint and remind yourself of how you should actually structure these things out and include exam structure on your revision flashcards if that's what you're using. Okay, you know, don't just have things like what was the Yalta conference, what was this, what was that, actually have a flashcard that says Right, how do you answer a four mark question? How do you answer a six mark question? How do you answer a 10 mark question? And these are the sorts of things you should be writing down uh, and be able to write down off the top of your head. Three, probably the most important one there, get a good night's sleep. I know it's easier said than done. You're gonna be a little bit nervous and blah, 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 but really try and get a good night's sleep, okay? Um, do whatever you need to do, okay? Put your electronic devices outside your room, meditate, um, you know, play calming music, chill, you just whatever you, know, whatever you need to do to distract yourself, to try and get yourself to sleep, then you know it works for you. Try and get a good night's sleep. Um, in the morning of the exam, um, do eat breakfast, that's really important. Um, make it kind of fiber if you can. Sugar is to be avoided. Uh, sugar will give you a very short-term boost and then a very long-term crash. And in a two-hour exam, you don't want to be flying for the first 10 minutes and then suffer like a sugar crash for the next hour and 50. That's not a good way to go. So instead, before you go in, if you are someone that drinks caffeine, then it might be wise to, you know, have that coffee or, or whatever it is, um, but try not to have it with, with sugar, you know, try and avoid, like I said, sugary things. Don't go in there and eat a chocolate bar before you go in. Again, you're gonna get the sugar crash. Instead, something like um, a banana, uh, which has got slow energy release would work really well. Uh, dark chocolate is uh, tipped to be relatively good. It's, uh, it's actually got caffeine in it. Um, and it's also low sugar by the standards of chocolate. So um, that could be something that you might look at doing. And like I said before, keep working right up to the end of the exam. Okay, hopefully that has been of some use to you. You can go back to the video, watch, rewatch bits. You've got the PowerPoint itself as well. So you can go through it at your own pace and your own time. Best of luck. You've worked incredibly hard to get to this point and you all deserve to do very, very well. I've been very impressed with the way that you've handled yourselves uh, over the last six months especially but over the last two years as well it's not been easy i mean 
one or two things that have cropped up that have, uh, uh, you know, could have been a distraction. And I think you've done incredibly well. And, you know, no other class or generation has ever had to face those kinds of conditions. So you can be proud of the fact that you've you've dealt with them so well. So well done. Do one thing at a time and you'll be fine. Good luck.